All right. Marty, is that you? We're getting uh, extra music from somewhere. That might be a... Uh... All right, groovy boy. Who's the guilty party? I don't know. Hey, everyone. Hey, uh, we're getting it figured out now. I promise. Uh, welcome to this week's edition of A Sip of Knowledge with Marty Duffy, Liz Rhodes, and Lou Bryson, plus this week's special guest, Charles McLean, who I will let your host give a more formal introduction to in just a moment. Real quick, before we get started, uh, I'm Will Hookinga from Zavi.co. Just want to point out, as always, a few different ways you can interact with your hosts and their guests throughout the show today. So to your right, you'll see a chat box. Uh, feel free to say hello. Let us know where you're joining us from. See several familiar faces from around the world already. We've got Brad Krauss from Panama, Kathleen in Southern California, Monique Houston, a former past guest on the show from Chicago. Uh, we have Graham Frazier from Sterling, Scotland. Uh, Jim from Amsterdam. Awesome. So always good to see people tuning in from around the world. Christina from Germany has to be there somewhere. Yeah, Christina's probably in here somewhere. She hasn't said anything yet. But um, <laughs> if, uh, on another note, if you have questions at any point throughout the show, there's a little button at the bottom that says ask a question. That's the best place to uh, enter that in for us. And uh, last but not least, feel free to uh, invite your friends to join us. There's a share button at the top that makes it easy to do that. Uh, but that is enough from me for the rest of this show. I will turn things over to Marty, Liz, and Lou now. Take it away. Thanks, Will. You are the bestest times 10, my friend. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Martin Duffy, former senior master of whiskey for Diageo. Don't get out of your chair or anything. Uh, 18 months, glorious months as the uh, national brand ambassador for Benedictine. Uh, I'm sure you all know me from that. And then... Uh, <laughs> Uh, eight years as co-producer of the Chicago Independent Spirit Expo, and currently in my uh, almost seventh year uh, as the sole representative for Glencairn Crystal in North America. Look at that. Oh, I got the, the, the cherished blue one. That's nice. Yeah. So there you go. That's it. Not much more than that. My <laughs> life, life kind of ends right there. Passes <laughs> before your eyes, as it were. Poof. <laughs> Lizard? Thanks, Marty. Um, hey, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, I'm Liz Rhodes, technical distiller and spirit consultant. Have just over a decade of experience in the alcoholic beverage sector, uh, spinning across several different products and substrates, including beer, rum, vodka. But my particular favorite expertise, of course, is whiskey. <laughs> uh, spent most of my career at uh, a little outfits called Diageo, but now I'm currently founder and principal at Spirit Safe Consulting. And hey, want to learn more about that? If you scroll down to the about the host section, there's a little link to my website. So give it a little click, check it out. Missing link, really, a little ape. Lewis? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Lou Bryce and I am a whiskey writer. Um, but I'm joined by a whiskey writer today. I'm not feeling so lonely for a change. Um, <laughs> I was the uh, managing editor of Whiskey Advocate magazine for 20 years. I am currently a senior drinks writer with the Daily Beast news website. Uh, I have my uh, latest book, Whiskey Masterclass, which I'm happily plugging in the classic tasting whiskey. Um, and today I am drinking uh, the new... Michter's uh, US One Rye release, which I just got in the uh, mail yesterday, and it is cask strength, but sipping nice. Michter's Rye is a lovely liquid. So, yeah. <laughs> it's a very nice one. <laughs> Marty, if you would introduce our guest, please. I would be uh, more than pleased to, Lou. Uh, this week, well, obviously every week we have our own distinguished whiskey writer, Mr. Bryson, with these wonderful tomes right here, right? <laughs> uh, this week, however, we have a gentleman who, let me see, he's written uh, some of these. That's, uh, yeah. Uh, and this is, I couldn't take the rest out or my apartment would fall. <laughs> they're, they're holding up the ceiling. The rest I think of them. those are, all those books behind Charlie are his, are they not? <laughs> yes, they're, they're all written by him. <laughs> Last year. 
<laughs> he figures he'll, he'll get other authors in there at some point. And he has room. But right now, uh, but this gentleman, this gentleman actually, to me, has been, he is the, uh, he's the Odin. If, uh, if Lou is maybe uh, Loki, um, uh, he is the Odin of whiskey writers because I've been reading his stuff since I got into the whiskey side of things uh, back in the 90s, I want to say. I could be predating you, uh, Charles, but the guy's done it all. If there's any authority on Scotch whiskey, it, I can't think of anyone other than Mr. Charles McLean. Welcome, yes, Charles. Indeed. You're you're the well, man. I, it's very kind of you, really. Yeah, I've been I've been at it for a long time, forty years. As a matter of fact. I, forty I, years. I, I wrote, so I'm ahead of you, man. We. Uh, <laughs> um, no, I, I wrote my first um, little pamphlet for it was for Bell's, as a matter of fact, in 1981. So it's exactly forty years. And I'm now, wow. I'm now I'm now working on my 18th book about. Wow. I mean, how many ways are there to skin a cat? You know what I mean? <laughs> but when, 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 when um, well, two things. First of all, the, the, the uh, people say to me, you know, hey, man, you know, you must have the best job in the world just drinking whiskey for a living, which actually is what I do, you know. Um, and uh, how do you get a job like that? I say practice, practice. You'll agree with that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Drink lots, you know. <laughs> Yeah, so I yeah. mean, so all right, 40 years, you're obviously still a young man, uh, still yeah. young and vibrant. Um, but, uh, you know, how what led you into this, especially 40 years ago? We yeah. Talked, that's the early 80s. Yeah. And where yeah. Scotch whiskey, especially, it was on. Not an uh, auspicious and, time to start writing about whiskey. Yeah, they mm -hmm. had, yeah. hit a big valley in the early 80s. So, what, what got you into it? Chance. Purely chance. I was I was originally trained as a as a, as a lawyer as an attorney. Um, oh God! And, wow. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. I mean, I, and this was my second degree. I mean, I, I spent the whole of the seventies trying to discover what on earth I want to do, and I still haven't discovered it to be honest. But I've, I've, I've found myself in this on this track, and uh, and hey, I don't regret it at all. You know, m m most of my legal contemporaries are now judges or retired from being sort of uh, um, senior partners in major law firms. But they, they, all, they all rather envy me, you know, even though I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have a pension. I don't have a pension. You know, I live, live really from, from, from hand to mouth from week to week. But, the, you know, I, I, I don't regret it. No, the, so it was really by chance that the, uh, when I got out of the law, um, I set up as a literary agent and then promptly starved, and then um, out of that came commercial copywriting. So, so independent mm -hmm. copywriter, and the um, and then um, the, as I say, um, among many other. I mean, obviously, one one's a whore as a as a writer anyway. And the uh, um, <laughs> so the the, the um, hey, some people uh, do it for pleasure. I hear. I don't understand. <laughs> that. I don't know. Lose confirmation name. Oh, <laughs> <don't get> <laughs> Anyway, so the, the, the and during the 80s, I, by this time, so the agency was still running. Um, we were doing some initially ghost writing for, for authors who couldn't write. Um, and then um, and then I was writing books under my own name, books, words for cash, you know, sort of uh, the, 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 the broad area would be Scottish nonfiction, you know, sort of towns, apartments. Village. I read a book called the, the the Fishing Villages of the East Coast of Scotland. This sort of stuff. And wow. the, uh, but the and it was always good to have um, a book in the back burner um, when the, the 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 commercial writing was slack. Um, come 1988, I had done a lot of work for a, a many um, whiskey companies. Who were uh, you're right? You're absolutely right, Marty. That the the it was the, the industry was in dire straits at that time, but malt whiskey was coming up and it was it was really coming up. I mean, it's interesting. You know, in in, in 1981, the only one percent or less than one percent of the 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 whiskey produced um, was sold as single malt. The whole the, the for for the previous century, really the the. Um, um, it had all been dominated by Glenville Scotch, and all all the malt whiskey made 
went into blends. But during the, the 70s, slowly and then gradually in the 80s, the, um, there was a growing interest in, in Scotch malt. And, um, and I was lucky to be there. I wasn't aware of it at the time, to be honest, but the, um, um, and helping the writing brochures and things like that. Come 88, um, I didn't have a book on the back burner. Um, I had a, at least a, a decent track record to make a first of a proposal to a publisher for, uh, for a book about Scotch. Um, and um, and and a, and, a, and a, a, a huge interest now in the in the in the in the in the subject. So that was the first one that was commissioned in eighty eight. So I say published in ninety. I think it was ninety two. And you know, after that, no looking back. You know, the the um, I did a formal training. I'll tell you about this later. But the uh, the formal training in what's rather grandly termed the sen sensory evaluation of pos potable spirits um, in in ninety two. And the uh, and that's that. So, so writing um, my my key areas are history of Scotch and um, and sen sen sensory evaluation. The um, so that's in a, in, a, in a nutshell the uh, how I man how I managed to drink for a living. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I always like you know I always enjoyed your books because they were not um, when you did put tasting notes i like the fact that sometimes you'd even be questioning yourself you know you say mm. is it bananas you know you put a little question mark after a, a tasting note and i kind of like that that it wasn't this definitive thing and i don't know it didn't seem heavy on tasting notes uh and i'm more of a history guy myself so i like the history that you put in there um I don't want. I don't really care what someone else is tasting so much. Yeah, I just as soon find out about it and taste it myself. Right, exactly. Yeah. I've always thought that was crazy. It's so important. I think it's extremely arrogant. I never put scores against that right there. my um, my notes because I think it's. I mean, who am I, frankly? I mean, I've got as you have, Lou, and indeed you, Marty, the the uh, um, you know a lot of experience, but the the uh, I still think it's. It's arrogant to to put a price, put a put a score like Robert Parker, you know, and the the or or indeed um, 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 Jim Jim Murray, you know. I mean, sure. I mean, publishers love it. They want it. They want to make it easier yeah. for the consumer. Mm -hmm. But you've got to. It's only one person's experience at one moment in time, you know. The the uh, and you know we all know that the the the, the care that the the distillers American distillers as well as Scotch distillers I mean you know the care that goes into producing the liquid and to give it to to to, to arrogantly market um, and, and and therefore doom it let so let the person know give one one uh, one person's opinion at one moment in time. But encourage people to make their own, make their own observations. You know? There is no, I'm sure you'd agree. There's, there's no absolute tasting note. You know, no. it, 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 it's a combination of objectivity yeah. and subjectivity. Yeah. One tries to be objective as as far as possible, um, especially with the whiskies you don't really like very much. You can be sort of coldly objective. <laughs> I know. I, I tend to be overly objective on those. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Well, dude, it's crazy when you have you also have you know various people, not just Jim Murray, but I think he's the most prominent example of naming the best whiskey in the world. You know, are you nuts? One of the best whiskey in the world, and also, what happened to last year's best whiskey? Did you take it out of the competition, or did it just kind of go south over the last yeah, year? Yeah, why, yeah. Why hasn't someone been the best whiskey for like ten years straight? Yeah, yeah, no. It's, it's, enjoyed what uh, the classic malts, um, you know, publication in terms of, not, yeah, not necessarily a ranking because I totally agree it's it's subjective, um, but they, you know, published a PCA, so a principal component analysis and kind of said, here are some whiskeys that are clustered together. Here are some other whiskeys that are clustered together. If you like that one, you're probably gonna like this one next to it. <laughs> So that was a much more, I, I feel like, consumer-friendly way of. Absolutely, that was the flavor map that our, our dear <laughs> friend Dave Dave Broom put that together with with Jim Beveridge from from Diageo and the, uh, um, and that that's perfectly legit and, and and perfectly fair. Although even within that, it's a, it's a loose guide, you know. Yeah. Um, right. 
And the, there's nothing absolute about it. It's all to do with, we all know, it's the, it's the occasion, it's the, the people you're with. And the. Um, I often tell a story about the, uh, the, the best whiskey in the world. Well, the best whiskey in the world, of course, in Scotland, is the one, you, the one you're about to buy me. You know. um, <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, um, the, the, I, I was once invited many years ago down to go and fish for salmon on the River, river Tweed. Um, and it was in November. It was bitterly cold, a bitterly cold day. And I went into a wee grocery shop, leaving about 7 o'clock in the morning, wee, an early opening grocery shop, and bought a, a, a bottle of blended scotch that I'd never even heard of, you know. It was one of these things you can only find in these kind of shops. <laughs> and um, we uh, drove down. Um, it was a bright day, but very, very cold. And, of course, in November, the light fades at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So the, there were six rods, and the... Um, and we were all numb with cold, and we retired to the hut, um, and the old stove was got going, and the pretty lamp was was lit, and so on. And our host just took this bottle and just divided it in big big tumblers, quick <laughs> way. You know. And the 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 in the sort of half light of this, and we were warming up. Somebody had caught a nice, clean, fresh fish, um, which the morale was high. And everybody said this was the finest whiskey they'd ever tasted. You know, no, it was shite. It was very, very ordinary, very ordinary blend of Scott. But under the circumstances, it was ambrosia. Perfect. It, you know, and the, the it could happen at any time. Situation, company, you know, m morale, and so on. Um, and hey, you know, whiskey's for drinking. You know, it's it's it, we all do a lot of analysis and and this sort of thing. I love it. I, I love doing. The, the um, analysis, but the um, but at the end of the day, it's a drinking, and the uh, uh, there's no point in getting too heavy about it, you know. The the um, um, anyway, the, uh, well, no, no, you know, that's I mean, that's a good point. I mean, that so many uh, books nowadays they they try to uh, or and, and it's also consumers they try to break down. Yeah. Uh, whiskey to its its atoms, you know. It's trying to figure yeah. out who yeah. with, with, how, with how many rows, you know, is that four row barley? Or yeah. Where was yeah. that barley yeah. grown? And it's like fuck, just drink it. It's in the bottle. That stuff in the bottle. That's what you're drinking, not the yeah. barley over in some field. That's what the 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 culmination is. What it's all about, and people get so doinkish about it. And I don't understand why. And that's what. What drives me crazy when, and particularly on Facebook whiskey groups, I see these people saying X whiskey is garbage. Like, I, yeah. No, oh, it's yeah. not. Not yeah. to a lot of people, it's not. Because right. I had a, I had an extremely similar experience to yours with a bottle of Jack Daniels, and we finished off the bottle, the three of us. And you know, I just can't stand it when people run down Jack Daniels anymore. I'm like, yeah. you weren't in that fish shack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I think from that statement, there's been a lot of studies, right? Unbranded consumer mm. studies versus mm -hmm. branded, and the data is actually, in some cases, completely opposite. And I think that's you're absolutely right. That's an important factor. It's like when the New York Times, I think, did a blind taste test of all these vodkas. And mm -hmm. someone slipped in there, supposed to be all high end vodka, and someone slipped a bottle of Smirnoff in. Yeah. And Smirnoff <laughs> ended up beating them all. And I was like, and everyone was all shocked. Oh, but Smirnoff's supposed to be you know, cheap and crap. It's vodka, number one. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, wait, wait, Liz, is that okay? Is that is that reasonable to say? Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. You've made it. Yeah. 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 Going back to what you were saying, Lou. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> People getting very worked up about the precise ingredients. This is um, becoming more relevant um, with the, all these new distilleries, particularly in the US, but also in Scotland, um, all looking for points of difference and thus exploring, you know, different yeasts, different barley varieties, different mature, uh, fermentation times, all the, all, all the stuff, which um, well, they can't. In Scotland, they can't. Well, in Northern America, can they can they use any other wood than oak? But the uh, mm. um, you know, it's all to look for. But it's all to do with flavour. 
And this is so interesting because so we may have, because the certainly, well, I'm, I'm sure in the US as well, the the uh, most of the whiskey made was was going to be blended and and um, um, or put into you know whatever it is. So we're branded for one thing or another, and Scotland blended. Um, and the uh, so there wasn't the same concern about the flavour of the individual malt whiskies until until malt whisky began to take off. But in this climate, uh, and, and this it's going to be a very, very loud marketplace in about five years' time when there are dozens of new brands of malt whisky, Scotch malt, mm. coming off the market. And the, and they're always fighting for the story, fighting for the for, for the, 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 the USP the, 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 that differentiates them from a production perspective. And some of it will be very, very interesting. I mean, uh, 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 I welcome it in, 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 in many ways. The, 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 you know, exploring different ways of creating flavor, you know. Um, anyway, so there's ups and downs, but the, the but in the end, it's, it's to, it's to be drunk. You know? Well, uh, going on the thread, I, I don't know if we were, uh, we were talking about it pre-show about the uh, number of uh, Diageo programs that, uh, they created and then just dropped like a hot potato. Uh, this was something called the Whiskey Network, which was involved for uh, distributors. But there was, again, a very good video that was uh, accompanied it. And it was you and the aforementioned Dave Broom. And you're tasting through all the whiskeys. And then the two of you said something that I always like to throw at people who, were, uh, who disparaged uh, blended scotch. And just we're all about single malts. The two of you named uh, your uh, your uh, stranded on a desert island whiskey, and what you both said Johnny Walker Black Label. Now, <laughs> true, you were probably booking the paycheck from a certain company. No, but... would, would that be the case? But no, <laughs> you know, I, I was the, as you may know, I was the first editor of Whiskey Magazine, and part of my job during the time that I was the editor was to interview people in the trade, um, it, any, whether they were blenders, whether they were management, whether they were collectors, whatever, um, for each issue. And, um, and my last question was always, apart from the whiskey that you are involved with, which whiskey do you have the highest regard for? Mm. And I swear about 80% said Johnny Walker Black Label. Not Blue Label, not Red Label, Black Label. And the, um, it's that, amazing that, how they make so much of it so good for that price. It's just yeah, amazing. Yeah, it is. And the, it's the consistency, the stocks they've got to draw from. Of yeah. Course, vast. And the, um, so never, so my message, and, and that is still the case. And, I mean, I mean, uh, unfortunately, the, uh, I can't, I'm, I wish, I wish Johnny Walker would send me a case from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> they ought to. The, the, uh, but the uh, but they don't, and so the uh, <laughs> and so, so 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 it's a sort of high days and holidays. It's a special only, only when it's on offer in the supermarket do I buy that. <laughs> yeah, uh, um, but it, it's a great whiskey, and it's it's consistent. It's it has changed, as as some of you may know, having tasted. If you it's it's well, there's an interesting tip for all those listening. If ever you come across. An old bottle of whiskey. I mean, I mean, when, I, I, when I'm saying old, I'm not meaning old by age, but I'm meaning a, a, a whiskey, whether it's a blend or a malt or an American whiskey or a, or a straight bourbon, straight rye, made um, in the let's say so even the 70s, 60s, 70s. Um, uh, go out and buy the contemporary equivalent and do a comparative tasting. It is absolutely fascinating. Would you not agree? The, the, yeah. uh, to see, yeah. it, there's a phenomenon, there's a phenomenon in the industry uh, called flavored drift, mm -hmm. which really means that with the best will in the world, the, 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 uh, and sometimes it's by design. I mean, Bell's redesigned the whole blending formula for for, for Bell's whiskey because by 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 the time it became very successful in the early eighties, um, um, Bell's whiskey. Uh, they were using rubbish. They were. They, they, they were. They were, um, um, they were. I don't want to bad mouth any whiskey, but we. we it, it, it had slipped, you know. And then, so in the mid nineties, they reblended it all together and went back. In fact, I, I, I helped them um, 
and had privilege to to look at some of the very early blending books from way back mm. and of course using a lot of the the distilleries that Arthur Bell and Sons owned um, they were the they were the, the key whiskey the base whiskey the heart whiskey for for the blend and so they simplified the blend and went back to to using some of these so the that the flavor of that by design was different from the way it, it, it you like slips but it is a fascinating exercise to 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 taste whiskies made most of them bottled in the 1970s most of them bottled at eight years old malt whiskies or indeed mm. some uh, malt whiskies a lot most blends didn't have an age statement um but with eight if you like ten maybe but it, it is so interesting to see how the 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 flavor carries through uh walker um well i mean there, there is a difference between johnny walker black label from then and from now but it's 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 perhaps not as marked as in some cases. Um, anyway, sorry, I'm bubbling. No, no, no. Yeah, that's uh, that was something. Binnie's here in Chicago, the, the liquor chain. They found uh, two cases when they took over the old Ivanhoe store, which was a previously owned liquor store. They found two cases of Johnny Walker Black from the late '40s, early '50s. Oh, wonderful. And, Turned around and sold them back to Diageo. Eh, probably a very nice little. <laughs> um, and I have one of those bottles, mm. uh, and you taste it out. Johnny Walker Black back then, and you think too. I don't know if the war had something to do with it. Uh, they had to blend what they. they I know Churchill kind of gave them a, a pass, but uh, they still had to blend with what they had, right? And it was. I found it to be a lot smokier. Lots of smoke here. Yeah. Lots of smoke. Partly to do with forecasting too, right? So you mentioned sort of the oscillation of the Scotch whiskey industry and, and here in the US too of, you know, today things might be, you know, booming, whiskey might be doing really well, but eight years, maybe it's not so, or vice versa. So the blend probably might change just based on the stocks that are available you know, and you mentioned age claim versus no age claim. So then that, you know, that kind of feeds into the complexity. But I would imagine that that has a lot to do with, um, you know, blend shifts. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. That's that's one of the influences of the inventory that's available to the blenders. Um, yeah. But the, the, there is no doubt at all that, you see, before there was a terrific upsurge in in demand for blended scotch immediately after the second world war um and the the the, the simply wasn't the the, the 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 supply to meet the demand so as a result there were a lot of changes in production. for example um the the ever it, it, it prior to that it, every distillery had had its own floor maltings but there was no way they could produce enough malt to supply the, the, the from the blenders from the blenders now it's not for the um, um, so then centralized maltings came in um, and they, they to their own specification non peated lightly peated mm -hmm. heavily peated etc um, to their own specification they, they they came in but in the prior to that the the floor maltings that they're very difficult to control and. The, one of the distinguishing features from Highland malts, and that includes Speyside malts, which were all grouped under Highland region, was that they dried their barley over peat fires. So you'd think, oh, they're all they're all very smoky. Well, the answer mm -hmm. is no, because you run your peat very hot. Um, and the then uh. you can get because the, the the phenols only stick on the on the husks um, if the if it, when the, when the malt is damp, and so if you if you run if you run the kiln very hot, um, even if it's over a peat, a, a peat fire, um, you can you can achieve a, a light peating, and this was made particularly possible after the invention by Charles Doig of the what was called the Doig ventilator, i.e. the the pagoda. Mm. Um, for the, yeah. for the they, they had louvers that you could where you could increase the draft and so so on space side and every distillery on space side apart from Glen Grant and Strathila and they used a mix of 
what what they called silent pearl. It was it was coke and 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 um, <laughs> and tea. Lovely, isn't it? Lovely. The the That's uh, and the 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 to to to, to but you so you because because the blenders in those days in the eighteen nineties, this was in in uh, I think it was in, I think the first the first pagoda. Um, was in 1889, I think. Anyway, it was at Dalyuan Distillery. Anyway, but anyway, the uh, um, and so they want they didn't want this peaty style of whiskey, but right up until the 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 the, the and until the the till money was available, so until the early, early 60s, the malt distilleries were all still operating with their, their, their floor maltings, and so the spirit available was 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 had was more smoky. So therefore. The blends were more smoky, not 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 none like Isla smoke, but the uh, um, but they were more smoky, and the uh, yeah. Well, the, the geography of all the where the various blending houses started, like Dewar's is is up near Space Side, or if not in Space Side, depending upon where that border Highlands, is yeah, yeah, yeah. Highlands. Um, and they seem to pull a lot more Highland malts. Johnny Walker was obviously down in Kilmarnock closer towards uh, Campbelltown and the Isles. Um, so is that why they pulled so many of the smokier whiskeys and those whiskeys, those blends ended up being smokier? I mean, they pulled from where, what was closest? Well, yes and no. The interesting enough, Marty. The the um, um, Walkers owned uh, um, built Annandale Distillery, which has now been revived. Um, and Annandale made both a, a non-peated and a peated version. So the 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 so the, the I don't know, Nick Nick Morgan. Well, he well, you know what he's like. He's he's, uh, but he he said to me I, because I say to him, why is Johnny Walker Red Label so harsh? It's very rough. It's got what what used to be esteemed actually as it was called the bite. You know, when it when oh. it went, it was a sort of bite, uh, peppery. I mean, the um, which it is you know it's a brilliant whiskey for making cocktails, but it's a it's pretty rough as guts. You know, for 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 drinking. <laughs> <laughs> but the uh, um, and he said, "Well, he said, and I'm sure he was just as he does purely speculating." But the uh, he said, "Well, the first market, of course, for Walker's whiskies from Kilmarnock were coal miners, and they they would come out of the mines when they on high days and holidays when they could afford to 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 buy um, whiskey." Um, they wanted they wanted this bite, you know, because their, their thrapple, as we say in Scotland, their throat was coat with uh, with with coal dust, and they wanted something that would clean up the coal dust. And yeah. the, 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 now, whether that well, that's probably highly speculative, but nevertheless, the uh, it was um, it's possible, you know. Um, that's crazy. Great, the, great it, chance it, for a segue here. <laughs> when when did the industry shift over from coal to oil, steam yeah. for heating the stills? Did that have an yeah. effect on flavor? Had to. Well, during dur again during the nineteen sixties, sixties, seventies, and that was another very so. I've, I've talked about maltings, but that was a significant move. And the third was the move from from worm tubs to to condensers. Oh, right. mm -hmm. Yeah. The. the the, it was all to do with efficiency. By by the time when the um, well efficiency and accountants, quite frankly, the mm. the uh, uh, I mean direct fired stills, the the, the it was it was considered certainly at the turn of the nineteenth century. Oh gosh, that's not nice, interesting. The, uh, <laughs> the, that sounded like me take my shoes off. <laughs> <laughs> This, this stuff is dangerous. Like, it's really dangerous. Well, I'm doing. I'm. I'm. I'm drinking Loch Lomond. Twenty, 20 years old. Oh, look at you! The, wow. uh, which I'm just working my way through. The, the. This is the second bottle I was sent because the first bottle was demolished in about half an hour. I, I had a few friends around against 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 all against all COVID instructions. 
<laughs> I had a few friends round and for, 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 for dinner. And after dinner, we, we demolished an entire bottle. As I say, probably about an hour, but the, uh, it's a very nice drum. But the, um, yeah, I mean, direct fired stills. You see, what they were all looking for, because they were supplying, the, the, the blenders wanted consistent. They wanted consistent spirit, you know. They wanted the spirit of, of each distillery's character, and they wanted it to be consistent. Otherwise, it messed up their, 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 their blend. No blender works to a rigorous, rigid recipe, like a chef, you know. But they, So they can find another whiskey to replace that flavor. I mean, it's an amazing skill, blending. Um, but the but so consistency of spirit was 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 and it was very difficult to achieve that with your own when you're making your own malt because it was variable <coughs> also by direct firing which was variable and you know they they were very difficult to run i mean do you remember the 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 first still the wash still you know when when it when it bubbled up before before the days of sight glasses because they you know the the yeah. they've got little, little windows, yeah, and in and the but the before the days, the the still man would bang a wooden ball um, against the side of the still, and he would judge where the froth was rising, you know, by the by the sound, you know, and he'd <laughs> shout. Yeah, you should closer, get one of those. You know, <laughs> more, more more fire, more fire, less fire, less fire. Break it out. <laughs> <Shut up. laughs> The first ah. bugger down below was raking it out and making <laughs> you know. And the uh, um, so the the it was much more efficient um, to have um, internal heating like a like a like a like a percolator like a, 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 a yeah. kettle, uh, but and the heat came from steam, which came from a boiler outside, and it would fed into the um, pans and coils and and heated the internally rather than, than externally but you know if you look at some of the old books one of the key influences on flavor was direct firing mm -hmm. it's like chefs today using copper pans you know mm. and the 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 they love copper pans i don't really know why but it's, it's because they always the it's they're much they're, they're, they're more conductive um of heat but the the but it was it was a contributor to flavor <clears throat> These all came out in the during again during the period we're talking about in the seventies mainly, um, the sixties and seventies. The the and then of course the third thing was which is a massive contributor to, to flavor is, is the and particularly to texture is the, the the way it was condensed with the wick the the the, the, the way the, the the alcohol vapor was condensed. Um, uh, in in you know, throughout history. The um, they were condensed in in pipes that were coiled pipes in a big tub of water called worm tubs. So the coiled pipe, copper pipe, was called the worm, and it was in a, a cold water tank outside, usually outside the distillery, in fact, invariably outside the distillery. And the um, and that tended to produce that didn't allow as much access to the. Or what what we're told, copper conversation, but the access to mm. to the vapor, to the to the copper, as if it was in the, the well, the 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 shell and tube condenser, which is like a big canister with maybe a hundred small bore pipes, and through the pipes flow cold water, and then the vapor goes into the canister and it condenses much more contact with 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 copper, therefore a much purer um, spirit. Okay, so the the worm tub speak make what 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 those who haven't call it, call a traditional spirit is dirtier spirit. It's the heavier spirit, you know, and the uh, uh, and the others. But they all went on to again for blending purposes. The blenders wanted a lighter style of spirit, a lighter style of whiskey when it was matured, and the um, um, so hence the the so you've got to change th through these three. Areas and there will be many others that the uh, um, you've got you've got you've got you 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 you're going to have a change in the in the spirit character and therefore in the character of the mature whiskey and therefore even the character of the blends. You know? 
Yeah. It's fascinating. It's Charles, crazy, yeah. Charles, though, they had a... Th oh, go ahead, Lizard. I was going to say, but some actually reverted back, right? I know there's, there's stories of moving from direct fire to indirect, and to your point, saying... Well, crap, this is a completely, you know, this is our spirit. Right? This well, is the same spirit. thing with uh, Worm Tub. D didn't, Dal, uh, yeah, Dal Dal Winnie. Dal Winnie. Uh, they, they had a Worm they, Tub and they went to a condenser. They tasted the whiskey and go, oh my God, it doesn't taste yeah. like Dal Winnie anymore. Yeah. And they went yeah. back. So, and, and there's yeah. only a handful now, right, in Scotland that actually mm -hmm. use a Worm Tub. Yeah. So, so many switch from a cool. Worm Tub to a condenser, didn't most, or at least a lot of them? discover, oh my God, our whiskey tastes different. Well, I, it's quite interesting to know the, 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 the you're absolutely right. The, 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 the Dalwini switched back. Did Beaumont, what did Beaumont do? They didn't have worm tubs, but the, anyway, the, 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 that, that's the only one that I know of that I recall the, the, the Dalwini. Now you'd need to think, cause I think Dalwini was, DCL, I, I can't, I, there'll be some reason and the, that they managed to persuade the owners, well, which I think was the service company limited, so the, the, the Diageo, the right. um, The consistency, I think you mentioned those earlier. <laughs> consistency, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, there we are. That, that's it. Thanks, Liz. You've rescued me. The, the, <laughs> the, 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 the spirit was not the same. I'll tell you a little story about yeah, don't worry. Next time she'll pull the rug completely out from under you. It's, it's a balancing act. <laughs> the the uh, years ago, the the um, the, the the manager of Dalhuni was a, a chap called Bob Christie, and you may have, I don't know if you ever came across him, Marty. The the uh, um, and the the but he reckoned he could tell the difference, uh, and indeed his boys could tell the difference between the whiskey made in the summer and the winter um, with, with the worm, with, with the worm water temperature. Right. Yeah. The water temperature, yeah. Yeah, Co colder. Although you can, as we know from being on the Malt Africa's course, you can uh, run your, your, your worm, your worm tubs quite, quite warm as they do at Loch Nagar. Um, but the, the, the good old boys used to, they, they preferred the whiskey made in, in, in the winter. Now you don't have that control uh, and and to, to, to that extent, in, in, in condensers, and so the whiskey will always be lighter, um, by definition, in, from mm. from a condenser, and so that's probably exactly why um, they reverted to to worms um, at Darwin. Yeah. You know, direct fire spring bank, right? That's a classic direct fire example there, and I don't know if they went. To indirect and switch back, or have always just no. Been? I think they it's the, they're direct fired. I think only on the wash stills, aren't they? Uh, um, I'm not. I'm not for certain. Then Glenfiddich, you see, they 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 they, they have direct fired. Are they all direct fired stills? And and McCallum, does McCallum not have direct fired stills? You're not, us. You're the man. I know. I know. <laughs> You're <laughs> over there, Charles. Go check this out. <laughs> we'll wait. So I, I guess just a, a question. So we've gotten a, a pretty robust kind of history lesson and, and what are some of the things that's changed over your lifetime, which is awesome. So looking ahead, do you anticipate, what sort of changes do you anticipate in the industry of, of Scotch whiskey? Well, yeah. Especially with all these new guys coming on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it was interesting what you mentioned earlier. Actually, you said a, a, a large number of new brands, new expressions are, I mean, essentially looming now. Well, one thing that is, well, let me start on a positive note. There's something like 40 new distilleries have opened since 2004 in Scotland. Mm -hmm. Now, Lou, you can tell me how many distilleries, uh, uh, well, major distilleries rather than micro distilleries have opened mm. in the US. And you're talking hundreds, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, even even if you cut it down to really large ones, you still have over over well over fifty. Yeah, yeah. I mean, good sized it, ones, but I mean, larger than than tiny. Yeah, hundreds. Yeah. So the. So when now this is I'm thinking this was, I think that the 
the capacity, and that this is also the 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 expansion of existing facilities. Look at McCallum, Glen Lewis, look at Glen Fiddick. Massive expansion in capacity. Um, I reckon we're back of the envelope calculation that capacity has gone up by at least 60% since 2004. The, the, the amount of spirit that the Scotch whiskey industry can produce. And that was uh, that was Rose Isle opening? Is that just from and that? That's, that's including <laughs> now, and it's, it, it's including the the um, the the, the um, Glenbergie, the new Glenbergie. I mean, you know, the, the, so the, the Rose Isle Glenbergie, Inch Derny in Fife, which is a big, big distillery, etc. Yeah. Um, um, the, but the, 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 you might say that the million dollar question is will will the demand for scotch whether it's malt or blend increase by 60 percent yeah um, but on the upsides the the uh, during the over the course of this plague period the the COVID stuff <coughs> the industry has been in full production pretty well in full production which means that the bean counters the guys that glass that, that pick clearance the glass balls um, still reckon that the, the demand in five, ten, fifteen, twenty years time, global demand, will be um, they'll need they'll need the liquid, they'll need the spirit, you know. Um, well, it, it, it remains to be seen. So then you've got so that so that, that that's a positive note. That really mm -hmm. is a positive that the the, the the, the guys who are paid vast amounts of money to forecast, look into the glass balls, um, are forecasting a, a big demand. Um, uh, and all, all, all these whiskies in, in every country in the world pretty well now, you know. In the, the, uh, um, but so that's, that, that, that's encouraging. To some extent, it's based on the hoax um, of Asia, China in particular, and India in particular. Um, both these are very dodgy markets. You, 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 you don't know what's going on there. Diageo is, is making yeah. big inroads in, 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 uh, through education um, in, in China, doing a terrific job, particularly malt whiskey. Um, Shivers, uh, they, they really broke into the Chinese market a long time ago, about, about 2000, and the, um, um, with, with Shivers Regal. But they're, they're, you know, they're moving in. So they, and the younger people are... Um, <coughs> they're not so interested in either Baijiu, um, mm -hmm. which is the best selling spirit in the world. Um, horrible stuff, by the way. I don't know if you've tried. <laughs> yep. I've not had the pleasure. Um, I, 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 I would, would not put it that way. That's <laughs> <way. laughs> curiosity, right? So. <laughs> and, um, and of course, cognac. It's a great, great brandy market, cognac market. And it still is, but cognac is now perceived as being kind of dad's drink, and the younger people in China are embracing uh, whiskey um, big time. And the uh, so hopefully that will go on. India is intractable because the every state sets the the uh, the, the tax and the licenses. Mm -hmm. Quite frankly, it's all to backhanders and family and one thing or another. So, if you want to open a liquor store, if you want to, you know, everything is 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 it's it's just impossible. Central government would love to rationalise it and reduce the the, the duties are the the the, the, the in India are way in defiance. They're of insane. The world World Trade Organization. Yeah, and, and and the Indians adore whiskey. And of course, imported American whiskey, Scotch whiskey, is is very very expensive. And the, uh, I mean, the, I don't know what the tax is now, Lou, but it's about. It used to be five hundred percent. I think it's. I think it's. Um, it's been reduced somewhat. But the, well, uh, I was going to say the last I heard it was around four hundred. So there we are. There not we much. Are. Yeah. yeah. Potatoes, potatoes. There. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. but honestly, every almost every Indian man I've spoken to in America. As soon as they find out I write about whiskey, <laughs> scotch is all they want to talk about. Yeah. Everything else just goes out the window. <laughs> well, another all interesting thing about. about India is that I, I read uh, the news, the, the spirit news every day, and there's always another case of of a large number of people, like 
a, a couple hundred dying of fake oh right scotch whiskey. In yeah. fact, I was even told when I was at Diageo that uh, bogus Johnny Walker outsold regular Johnny Walker in India. Yeah. Yeah, you know, just refill the bottles with God knows what. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very difficult thing. But you see, that was the case in, in I, I've seen papers from, from, from Johnny Walker for, for, for the 1950s where they, they, uh, they couldn't get, they, they, there was a sh chronic shortage, the demand was far more than the supply. And so they were refilling bottles. And, the, um, and they sent this young man, as they called him, with... Um, <laughs> the to to meet their their um mr wax mr wax of wax and vitale with the distributors in, in 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 italy to investigate and they went into a number of bars and cafes and so on in milano and in rome and so on, genoa and, so on. and they ordered you know johnny walker and of course it wasn't johnny walker it was it's been refilled and so Mr. Wax would go into the back room with the uh, the proprietor of the establishment and say, "This isn't our brand." And he'd say, "You give us, you give us our, your real whiskey, and we will not have to buy these um, these, these these things." But they, but never, never did we give the, the name of the supplier. You know, <laughs> but, the the uh, but India is 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 even worse because they're they're. In, in some cases, oh God, and, and indeed in China, it's very at a high level, but the India at, at a lower level, the, you know, there's a big trade, you know, the, 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 the wee boys, if they can pick up, the, or, 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 you know, very little empty bottles, and then they sell them on to, to people who will refill them with um, IMFL, Indian made foreign liquor. You know, which is not Johnny Walker or Shivers or whatever, you know, and the whiskey, and, and, <laughs> and it's so, it's so pretty. I mean, I don't know if you remember, Marty, the when you were working for Diageo, the, they spent a long time and a lot of effort in trying to devise a, a non-refillable capsule thing on the capsule. Yeah, um, right, 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 yeah. And it was, it was complicated. It was bloody nuisance. They still use it. And you couldn't yeah. shake it. it oh, it's horrible. And you and, can't put the optics on it. Uh, Buchanan's. You can't put the optics on it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Buchanan's, uh, they think they still have it. Because yeah, somebody would go to South America. Oh, the, the tamper proof stuff? Yeah. yeah. Really annoying. I, I was going to say, I've actually been out um, with some of uh, my former blending colleagues. And we went to a bar uh, in Chicago, actually, and the blender was like, "Return the drink," but it was like, "This is it." <laughs> it was like sort of this big stink. <laughs> yeah. So hey, you guys. see, the, the the story that I heard was that they spent years developing this. The wee boys in Calcutta, <clears throat> or whatever, they found a way of getting in and refilling <laughs> it. <laughs> Within about twenty-four. <laughs> Within about twenty-four hours, you know, and they're, 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 they're impossible. <clears throat> well, um, short, shortly, before. <clears throat> but then, then you get onto the um, the big price things, Macallans and so on, in these markets. Um, and I'm thinking particularly in China. The 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 um, shortly before, well, the the towards the end of last of you know, the 2019, I was in China um, for an event of some sort, and the. Uh, um, and then I was taken on on my on my way back. The, the flights leave from uh, Beijing at midnight, and the I was taken for dinner with um, a collector, um, a, obviously a very influential man. And he'd he'd um, um, there was there were, he brought along some of his friends and and their wives um, for dinner. We were on the roof of a building in Beijing, and. Um, and he produced some whiskies, which had been opened, but only slightly open, um, seven malts. And, um, and he, he was asking my opinion of them. Um, uh, three, three of the seven, or maybe four of the seven, were, were Macallans. You know, you're talking mm -hmm. Macallan, 30-year-old, you're talking, you know, so they, were, they were fancy, you know, sort of old-aged Macallans. They were all fakes. They were all fakes. And I said to my hostess, 
I said, look, these are fakes. You know, <laughs> should, should I say something? You know, <laughs> <laughs> breach of etiquette. And she said, no, you, must see, you must see, because, yeah, and you see, I think he, he doubted them. And um, mm. some sort of confirmation or comment and so on. So I, I told him, and, and there, were, there were there were a couple which were just ridiculous. They'd been they'd mocked up the label and the whole thing. The other ones were, I think, were were refill bottles, and the uh, very difficult to 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 spot. But they were there's no way they were McAllen, or if they no, I I I don't think they were, they were even McAllen. But there was certainly no way they were forty year old McAllen. You know? Well, they were going through a hard time in in the UK with with bogus McCallans a, a while back. It seemed like that was in the news. I don't know if that was ten years ago or so. I remember seeing but, that quite a bit. Well, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was that was when the um, McCallum distillery itself was buying buying back. Yeah. Oh, nineteenth century bottle or whatever for their own collection, and then. Some ducks, Daryl, Dave, he, Dave Broom, he, he, um, we, we all thought this is a bit odd. And I remember talking to, to uh, David Robertson, was the, 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 mm -hmm. the uh, <coughs> saying, you know, how is it that, that there, there are McCallans, these old, old McCallans come? I mean, remember they did their first replica, 1878 McCallan, bottled in 1890 or something like that, and the, uh, uh, the replica bottle. And the and then there were more. There was ones from the eighteen forties or one thing or other coming up. You know, wait a minute, that you know. And and and, and David said, who's a very decent guy, he said, we, we, we simply don't know. But the, mm -hmm. the, the, the all we can assume is that the McCallum was always prized, and so therefore was put in the, the back of the cupboard for special occasions. And then lo and behold, the the owner died, and it passed on and passed on. And passed on. That's all we can assume. But of course, then they were persuaded, thanks to largely thanks to Dave, the, 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 uh, to have some of these whiskies analysed. And of course, the, they can, the, the, in the nineteenth century, well, until nineteen thirteen, they all had driven corks like a wine bottle, yeah. and so you could put a sample with a hypodermic um, out and have it analysed. And the, um, and then the extraordinary thing is that the the. So there was a lab in Oxford. There's now one in Scotland somewhere, but there was a lab in Oxford that did this, and they can tell absolutely by carbon dating um, whether the whiskey was made, the liquid in the bottle was made before or after about 1950, because mm -hmm. all organic material after about 1950 have traces of, uh, of oh of, atomic of, weapons. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> after uh, after, after the, uh, the, the the tests in the Pacific, yeah. after the in Nagasaki, but the but also the tests in the in the you can tell absolutely. So the uh, U.S. military they've got it even 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 better now. They can they can narrow it down a bit more to to decades. Let's say. But you can tell absolutely by the the. Um, Full isotopes and God knows what, but this is red. Liz, does uh, she do you? No, I was gonna, I was gonna mention, since we're speaking about counterfeit liquids, whiskey. Sorry, Lou. <laughs> um, there's actually this new uh research um out of North Carolina State University, which is my alma, so go pack, um, around evaporative microscopy. In terms of, it's this whole thing called whiskey webs. So, oh, the pictures, yeah, I've seen yeah, that. the pictures. Yeah, so yeah. We're able to um, kind of visually map out, um, you know, different sort of whiskeys and find different patterns based on the evaporative property. That's consistent, really. I I think right now they've just been able to make pattern correlations. Okay. Specifically, and this is the other thing. I, I think the correlations are stronger with cast strength. Because obviously, once you dilute things, things start to change, um, you know, chemically. But uh, it's interesting. I, I think it's still early on, but I yeah, thought it was for a second. Come to the door. I'll be back in a second. Okay, yeah. What the? Hey! I thought it was worth mentioning at least. So. I thought he was doing a little dance. Got to <laughs> raise the roof. Raise the roof. Um, <laughs> hey, it's, it's worth saying, especially since we're running a little low on time. Yeah. Um, you know. Uh, 
uh, Charlie's uh, books are actually the basis for the Master of Whiskey oh, right. Certification course, which all of us are uh, on the advisory board, along with little Monique out there. Um, and uh, and, and <clears throat> when he comes back, I'd like to play a, just a little clip from a, a series that if you most of you folks haven't seen it out there. Uh, Charles started a thing a long time ago. I don't think he gave us exact time period, but he did a whole series that you can see on YouTube called Single Malt TV. That's fascinating. If you want to learn about, you know, the basics, uh, but also specifically about certain distilleries, or he has some just on fermentation, just some on maturation, some on just tasting, uh, some just on glassware. Thank you. I thought you were going to say just some on Marty. Yes, there is a little link, I think, to his website there yes. in that green rectangle. Yes. Um, so a couple of things, Charlie. We, I was just talking about how your book is uh, is basically the basis stuff for the uh, the testing for the master uh, masters of whiskey certification course. Yeah. Um, and we are all on the advisory board. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Great. Charles has loads of books. He's writing his 18th one, um, and they're all available. Just about all of them on Amazon. I was trying to count them on Amazon. And I don't know, man, because you're also uh, editing. out of fingers. Albums. Basically, because, you know, if he if he didn't write it, he was editor of it, you know. Um, but also we want to. Oh, so, hey, Will, can you play that little clip from uh, Charles's uh, Single Malt TV on YouTube? I love just talking to the air like that. Hey, Will. Will, my imaginary <laughs> friend. Oh! There you go. Play a little clip of this. It's like Siri. I can't hear it. We heard it last time. What happened? Will, Will you're fired. <laughs> anyways, <laughs> anyways, you guys can, you should go to YouTube and check this out. The other thing we want to talk about um, as time will... Oh, oh. Single whiskey is... And blended whiskey. Look how young you are. To the single whiskey, actually, we have two kinds single grain whiskies and single malt whiskies. Simply a product of a single distillery, an individual distillery. So See? Cool. Is that a stethoscope around your neck or is that a spoon? That, no, that's my, my monocle. But, oh, that's your monocle. Yeah, yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> you know, I've seen a picture of you with that and you remind me of the little Monopoly guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, from now on, anytime I play Monopoly, I, say, I would like the Charles McLean. I want the yeah. <laughs> I want Uncle Charlie. Yeah. Um, now, one thing you wanted to talk about, uh, and this is available on the link. So, anybody who you want you care to, you can click on the link and see a uh, uh, whiskey wheel that Charles put together. Uh, and when you go into this, because this this is a been an important part of analyzing whiskey over the last uh, decade and a half or so. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm delighted to talk about this. <clears throat> the whiskey wheel, the flavor wheel, was devised, uh, was the, the, not this one, but the, the, the idea uh, was come up with by um, an outfit called Pentland Scotch Whiskey Research. In and they published their their find. They were tasked by the the non DCL by the by the by the the the, uh, the independent companies to come up with a common language for the trade for blenders to describe uh, flavor. Now, flavor, uh, as as you all know, is is a combination of smell, taste, and texture. Um, so their wheel, the, the, the so-called Pentland's wheel, um, was very much for the trade. It wasn't for the consumer. Um, it was then, the, the Pentland's was then merged when, when, well, Diageo and Chivas came aboard in, oh, God, I can't remember, 1998, something like that. And th this was, the, this was for the, 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 their wheel was first published in, in uh, 1979. Uh, oh. For the trade, a tool to, for, for the trade. Um, 
um, the Scotch Whiskey Research Institute, which evolved out of Pentlands when when Diageo and and um, Chivas came aboard Panarica. Um, and they produced another variation on, of it. You can find them online if you, if you Google flavor wheels. <coughs> um, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, at the start, the, 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 I, I, did, I did a training with Pentlands on the Dr. Jim Swan legend and, um, and Sheila Bertels, who was the, she was known as the nose of noses and she was really responsible for coming up with the language for, for, for describing whiskey. You know, not set in stone by any means, but at least it was a common vocabulary which the blenders could all use when they were, you know, they could when they when they're buying, um, or or filling spirit or buying, um, you know, um, um, you know, mature whiskey, uh, they had a common language to describe it. But as I say, it was not, it was not designed for the consumer. So, I set about um, trying to produce a simplified wheel. Um, which this is a representation of, um, which which the the you you've got the in the wheel itself, you it, it's 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 the it's only eight uh, one two three four five six seven eight eight segments, um, the 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 pendulum wheel had at least twelve you know, and so the way you work it is that you start from the hub of the wheel, and the hub. Uh, are the, the, what, what, what are called the cardinal aromatic groups. So we've got grainy, grassy, fragrant, fruity, peaty, woody. Or, what is that? What we'll call that oily. And then the, the, there's one called off notes, which you shouldn't find in, in bottle product. And then beneath that, you've got um, breakdowns, um, simple breakdowns. Um, I can't read it myself here, but the the if you if you if, think of fruity, well you've got dried fruit, you've got tinned fruit, you've got fresh fruit, you've got citric fruit, etc. And then in the that that's the middle rim there, and then on the outside you've got descriptors that might lead you to to uh, to these things. I mean, if you look at look at um, peaty, which really breaks down into to medicinal and smoky. And then you've got grades of smokiness and grades of medicinal from from very very light to to quite quite pungent. You know. So those are the, that's the aromatic wheel, and then <coughs> down here you've got which in the original wheel was 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 was, was part of the wheel. You've got mouthfeel effect because as I say, mm. flavour is to do with smell, taste, and texture. So the the and and the so you so you've got taste and texture down here. Taste is quite simple because it's sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami, which is savoury. Um, and mouthfeel is 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 really to do with the texture, the texture in the mouth. You know, um, really quite simple. And it might be it might be mouth cooling, it might be mouth warming, it might be mouth filling, it might be waxy, it might be but it's relatively simple vocabulary. <coughs> and then at the bottom of the wheel. You've got a scale of of colours. Um, um, colour, of course, tells you to to a large extent of, of how the whisky has been matured. Um, and so you go from um, what I call xanthic, which is yellowy thing. This is my invention, um, yellowy, to amber, uh, to umber, the dark dark colours, which tend to come from from European oak. And then underneath that, I can't read it at all, but the I've got some equivalents of wines and things like that so it's a tool helpful i think i hope a helpful tool um to uh, evaluate a whiskey so if i'm looking at a whiskey the the i think i might pour myself something a bit special here but uh, <laughs> i bet you have I'm, bottles I'm, and I'm, bottles of something special around that's the other wall I, <laughs> well I'm, I'm, I'm privileged to, to be asked by many companies to analyze and look at these whiskeys this is a Nineteen eighty-nine Carrasco cast strength, and the um, and so <clears throat> I look at it, and it's 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 sort of pale gold in colour. So I, I I gauge it sort of um, pale gold, sort of Chardonnay, maybe slightly larger than Chardonnay, um, 
And then I, I would look at the, um, the nose feel effect, which is, of course, quite prickly. Talisker is quite mm. prickly, but it's also high strength. It doesn't give me the strength. It just says calf, calf strength. Um, um, so I would, I would think about the, the, the strength. And then I'd go back to the wheel and think, you know, what am I, what am I, I, I run through my mind. Am I getting any serial notes? Here we are. Grainy. Answer, no. Grassy, no. Fragrant, frankly, no. Fruity, perhaps a tiny bit, you know. Tiny bit, but it's more, it's more, it's a fugitive sort of dried fruity, could be dried figs, but very small. PT, yes. And are we looking at medicinal PT or are we looking at um, um, smoky PT or are we looking at maritime PT? Uh, well, mar I lump maritime, I think, in, in that segment. The, um, and the answer is that, yep, it's definitely PT smoky. Um, it's not medicinal like you know, like Kalila or 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 um, Ardbeg or a lot of the Isla whiskies. And then there's a there is a distinct sort of maritime. I'm thinking of seaweed. Sometimes it's dried seaweed. Sometimes it's rotting seaweed. Dare I say it? Fresh seaweed. This is sort of just sort of. It's the it's the beach. I'm on a beach, you know, and the, at, at, at the shoreline with the um, with the seaweed. Always. And the and there's a there's a sort of a <clears throat> it's a sandy beach, you know. The the anyway. Then then then, but there's also a sweet note there. The uh, I'm judging by the color. This this will be this will be refill American oak um, ex bourbon. But, and so, therefore, there's a toffee, there's a sort of toffee note, a very light toffee note. Mm, gorgeous. Uh, we, then I taste it, taste it straight. Sorry, Liz. No, I was at you said tasting. I just wanted to say that you mentioned the, the ABV, so what proof it's at. And I think that's another really important thing to remember because, uh, you know, dilution can play an effect into... Yeah. You know what volatilizes so i think that was yeah an important to distinguish absolutely right now i'm very glad you mentioned that because i'll come to that in a second because the what i usually do is to i usually taste taste straight this is this is clearly quite quite strong but as i say talisker is is um is quite quite prickly anyway you know i'm gonna rinse my mouth with water the uh... <coughs> Mm. Mm. First of all, it's much sweeter than expected. Um, and secondly, it's much more smoky than expected. And Talisker, one of the key notes of Talisker, even at this age, which is, um, well, 32 years old, um, um, it's still very vibrant, you know, it's still, it's still spicy. It, 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 as we all know, it's a characteristic of Talisker. Um, but then, <laughs> as you say, I, I always say to people that they never be shy of ad, about adding water to whiskey, particularly malt whiskey. I mean, with 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 blended Scotch, hey, or or you know, bourbon. Bourbon is great with ice. It's, it's some bourbons like JD. Um, Really designed to be drunk with 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 Coca Cola, um, um, ginger ale, great in the world. Um, malt whiskey, especially older um, Scotch malts, um, you know, they 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 you need to respect them a little bit more. But never be shy about adding water to whiskey. I mean, blenders work at. I mean, the the old saying was that uh, whiskey is the only other thing a Scotchman likes naked. You know, uh, 
Wait, hey, hey, what's the other thing? I, don't hey, hey. I would say, yeah, from an analytical perspective, I always appraise things at twenty percent ABV. What um, exactly? Uh, I, I, that, that is exactly the strength that that vendors work at twenty yeah. percent ABV. I frankly find that a bit low for for my analysis, but who am I? Um, but so I'm on this, and it also depends. It also depends where you are in the tasting, i.e. how much whiskey you've, and I've drunk two <laughs> <laughs> the, the, So the, the, you know, my palate sort of softened up a little bit. And the, uh, I'm, I'm going to add. I'm going to steal that. Just a little drop. And Charles, then, we had one question, though, while you're doing that. I just wanted to get that last question in. Um, yeah, you know, speaking of up. tasting special liquids, Whiskies. Um, there's a question from Graham. Which new distillers in Scotland and around the world are producing whiskies that excite you? Oh my God! Well, oh no. The that is a very difficult question. I mean, I might trivially say all of them, but yeah. the, the uh, of recent whiskies that I well, I, I the non-Scotch. Um, uh, Cavalan. Mm. Cavalan's produced his. his yeah. We're going to have Ian Chang on in a couple of weeks. I know. Oh, yeah. He's gone to Japan now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he's yeah. one of our Japanese distillery. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, now, what's the one in England? There's a very good. Uh, oh, God. What's it called? Um, the Indian. I uh, mean, you have Amarut and uh, Paul John has some, uh, some beautiful They've stuff. They've got some very good stuff. They've got J some very good stuff. Japanese whiskeys. Yeah. Uh, even Australia and New Zealand have some really nice ones. Oh, yeah. You bet. Yeah. The, 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 uh, the problem with, 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 um, um, with, with Australia uh, uh, in, in particular is that the, uh, the, Again, because of the climate, they, and they tend to fill it in very active casks, small, very active X wine mm. casks. Mm. And so they, they're, they're um, but um, they also they, have problems putting the whiskey in the bottle because they're on the upside down. <laughs> and so uh, it's very hard for that whiskey to stay and put the cork in there. We're, uh, we're I, I hate to be that guy, but we're, we're, unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap up. Will has yes. given us the uh, sign. We're out of time. Hey, yeah. Surely, this has been oh okay. Yeah, we well, got to have you have. back. Yeah. I mean, we didn't even talk about the Scotch bonnet. So we need to have you uh, on, talk about the, the Scotch yeah. bonnet. It's fascinating. I'll be here. Uh, I'll be. Uh, it's been a, such a pleasure talking to you guys. Really, uh, it's really. So so wow. oh, God, this is yeah. great. I, I, haven't, I haven't actually read any of the the, the your books. But the, uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm nothing to do with the the Malt Whiskey Yearbook, except I, I'm the only writer that has contributed to every every single one. It's, it's Ingvar Ronda. Um, That's not nothing. Yeah, yeah, and the, um, but hey. It has been such a pleasure, and it's, it's a good idea that I should terminate now before I fall over. <laughs> <laughs> Marty, well, do you want to tell us who's up next? Sure. So next week, uh, we come a little local. South of Chicago is a distillery that actually really does have pre-prohibition gangster roots. And that's uh, the Thornton Distillery in Thornton, Illinois, which also sits on the largest deposit of limestone anywhere in the, at least in North America as more limestone in Thornton than you have in, uh, uh, down in Kentucky, believe it or not. Uh, so, uh, we're going to have on, uh, Andrew Howell and Ari Cloffer, uh, who are uh, the owner and distiller, uh, they'll be coming on and Charles, you should be getting a very special present courtesy of Glen Karen. Not that you probably don't have tons of blank hair. Uh, no, don't worry. Uh, honestly, the, 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 I must just throw in the Raymond Davidson, who is the chairman of, of Ben Cairn, is a very, very good friend. He's now, he's currently trapped in Dubai. Oh, yeah. He, <laughs> That's he, right. he, he, he went there, I think, at Christmas time. And he phoned me, <laughs> he phoned, he phoned me last, last week because he can't come back to the UK without going into three weeks quarantine at 1700 pounds a, a week you know mm -hmm. for he and his wife and, uh, 
And he says, he says, but you can't even get a drink in the UK. It's, he says, isn't it ironic that you have to go to a Muslim country to buy a drink? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he's whooping it up, and I'll get late night calls from him as well. Who I, uh, and usually from he's Bart. a great, great man. Great, yeah. great man. The whole, lovely. But don't, don't, don't worry. Sending me glasses. I don't care. I'm, I really it's already it. done. Too late. <laughs> oh well. Yeah. Well, they're special. Make... They're a little special. You'll see. Oh, how kind of you. Um, so kind. Everyone, check out Charles's link uh, yes, down there. Do. Check and out, check out, his out books. the Single Mall TV. Yeah, and Single Mall TV is very, very cool. Everyone else, thank you very much. Rick, Nick. Thank you so uh, much. See everybody. The usual suspects, thank you very much. Cheers, thank everyone. You, thank you all. Thank you so much. God bless Charles, you. Charles, we'll see you folks. in Scotland. Aye, indeed. Mm -hmm.